Imagine, if you will, my dear viewer, a small countryside village. Neither rich nor poor, neither weak nor strong, though contented in its quaint simplicity. Honest men and women harvesting their crops and managing their storefronts, children playing in the streets, delighting in the simplicity of their lives. It is a still place, a happy place. Until one day, that stillness is disrupted. Uh, perhaps it was a comet streaking brightly across the sky, or a sudden, unforeseen storm. The exact cause doesn't particularly matter, but something happens to this little village. And it is no longer still. An accusation is made of corruption, of a dark force outside tainting the community, a force which must be stopped. Accusal breeds suspicion. Suspicion, fear, and fear, chaos. Soon enough, the entire village is transformed from a contented and simple abode to a coven of hatred and terror. And this is when the violence begins. Tradesmen find their shops looted, farmers their lands stolen, Women are whipped in the streets and dragged by horses. Men are crushed between stones. And the great tree in the town center, once proud and lush, is now nourished by the blood of the corpses which dangle from its limbs. This corruption, this chaos, spreads as a pestilence through the countryside, infecting all that it touches, and soon neighboring communities find themselves shipping human chattel to the village to be tried and slaughtered for fabricated crimes. The years pass, and slowly the accusations stall, and after some time things begin returning to normal, whether by divine intervention or sheer exhaustion it is unknown, and the villagers return to their old ways, those that are left at least. Eventually, it is decided by the community that something ought to be done to mark the village's past, something to commemorate the events and keep the history in memory to encourage a cultural awareness of the past. And so the village throws a festival, a massive celebration with games and rides, singing and dancing, with engorgements of food, drink, and carnal desire. To honor their falsely accused mothers and fathers, the children emulate their dress in comedic fashion, wearing hideous makeup and masks to take on a mocking and surreal caricature of the beasts their parents were accused to be, that which they were murdered for. And every year the festival grows and grows until eventually the entire identity of the village comes again to revolve around that same violence and chaos of old, though now as a matter of pleasure and delight, even pride. There are, of course, those in the village who object to this merriment and delight, uh, much to the consternation of their fellows. Lighten up, they're told. It's all in good fun. What does it matter? It makes people happy. We're, we're just having fun. And those with a stronger mind for utility may point to the incredible economic value of the festival, which has left the village far richer and stronger than it had ever been before, as people travel from across the countryside to celebrate and spend their riches on toys and baubles resembling the torturer's tools and to pose in funny ways before the mass burial pits. Countless members of the village now rely on the festival for their livelihoods and prosperity. In a way, it is effectively argued, the terror was the greatest thing to ever happen to the village. It turned it into a cultural icon. Look at the happiness it has created, the prosperity that it has generated. And to think, it only took the torturous slaughter of a few innocents to make it all happen. Now. I do apologize for this sentiment, but I do hope that this story has inspired within you a certain disquiet, a sickened sense that something is wrong and that our tale's ending ought not be so happy as it is made out to be, as in fact it is deeply disturbed. Now, of course, this story is a fictional one. It is expanded and exaggerated to further make a point. But all the same, my dear viewer, I must ask you, does it not sound familiar to you? 
You see, every October, and Halloween especially, the town of Salem, Massachusetts really becomes one such sight, a festival celebrating uh, a very dark and terrible past. The streets are filled with people, food carts line the roads, uh, uh, shops and stands sell their baubles and their wares, making mockery of the tortures of the past. There are games and little rides, carnival rides or fair rides, in the streets as well, and of course there are all sorts of performers lining the way on top of it all. See, I had the rather interesting experience of uh, going down into Salem earlier this month, and you can see some of the footage that I captured from the uh, uh, occasion just over here. Now, this was in the middle of October, so, you know, nothing too terribly special. October 16th or what have you is not exactly a very special day, but in Salem, all of October is a celebration of all things uh, morbid and dark. I'll share a little bit more about my experiences there before I get to my actual point. The crowds, of course, were so thick, as you can again see from some of those screenshots, that uh, at times my party and I were forced to go into single files in attempts to try and weave our way through them. Uh, arms kept tight to the body, and of course, uh, making sure you keep careful watch of your valuables and belongings, uh, lest something gets snatched out in the crowd, uh, as if moving through some major hub of a city, like some New York or Trafalgar Square or something. There were countless shops and stands open on the side, each one of them touting some sort of uh, witchcraft theme product or other. Uh, uh, one shop, for example, happened to sell, heaven forbid, I don't, I don't even know what they're supposed to be really, but little vials of, of, of powder, of colored powder or something like that, uh, uh, with the aim, of course, that if you were to, I guess, mix them into a potion of some sort, uh, they might increase particular aptitudes and uh, taste, you know, things like um, charisma or intelligence or other things, indeed. Um, uh, there are other shops, there are other stands that people would bring out into these little um, uh, uh, flea markets of despair. Uh, people claiming, at least, that what they were selling were actual human bones, which I highly doubt. People selling things like bedazzled skulls that they were able to make by their own hands. Uh, there's even one gentleman who insisted to us that he was selling actual live, well not live, but real, uh, bits of mummy that he had uncovered, I suppose, somewhere in the dark Egyptian sands or something like that. Um, indeed, uh, I, uh, I had heavy doubts about that. I'm not going to pay $300 for a piece of tattered cloth which supposedly came from King Ramses or something. But, um, but indeed, he had a great deal of things to say to us about how, oh yeah, you know, he, uh, he goes all over the place buying all sorts of, you know, weird, cool, and, and you know, um, uh, freaky things, as it were. Um, yes, well, for whatever that's worth. Uh, and of course, he was not the only one. As I said, people were selling things that they claimed were real-life human bones, as if that's a natural thing to a person to want to purchase, um, as a hobby of all things. Um, Although, not entirely certain that I can speak as far as strange hobbies are concerned, but you get the idea. Um, it's all sorts of very many strange things being sold. Uh, there were, outside in the streets, again, massive food carts and, and food stalls, stands, little temporary shops being popped up, selling all sorts of carnival food, as if I had gone to the Topps Field Fair, uh, if I wanted to, purchase fried pickles and Oreos, sure, why not, uh, fried dough, uh, uh, corn dogs and hot dogs and hamburgs and all sorts of, you know, very um, um, delectable uh, yeah, fare. Um, Oh, and of course, massive turkey legs, because of course everyone knows that the Middle Ages, they didn't have silverware, they just ate everything, whatever. Um, yes, turkey legs and whatnot, very Renaissance fair like Indeed, a lot of the uh, costumes as well that were on feature in Salem at the time were also very Renaissance fair uh, sorts of quality. Uh, you know, all sorts of people walking about dressed in whatever sort of uh, witch uh, cosplay and fancy dress they could find uh, as, as orcs and goblins, as murderers and all sorts of beasts and whatnot. Uh, again, just a small selection of things there. Of course, I wasn't going around taking photographs of other people. That would be creepy. But, um, well, you can imagine how severe Veer it might get, and uh, I'll see if I can't put some stock images up that other people took. That's all right, and you can uh, get the uh, get the picture, as it were. Strange mockeries, uh, you know, people pretending to be that which 
people were accused of being in the past, but uh, we'll get to that in a bit here. Um, otherwise, some other things. Oh, well, yes, of course, um, as you may imagine, every museum in the town was completely packed. Couldn't even get into the Witch Museum, which I wanted to try and do, but looked at the queue out the door and figured, maybe not. Maybe maybe another day that'd be for the best. Um, yes, indeed. There is also, of course, uh, places like the Witch House, uh, again, the historic home in Salem, which became quite popular for all the people to take their self fees in front of and uh, to obsess over, oh yes, the fact that people died that, uh, somewhere nearby here. Oh, how spooky and whatnot. Um, and yes, indeed, of course, there is even one example of an old historic home constructed first in, I think, 1820-something or thereabouts, you can see it here, uh, which, of course, had been very conveniently turned into not a memorial, not a monument, not an educational experience, but some sort of seance type thing. Yes, indeed, quite a, um, quite a legacy for that historic building in particular. And it's, again, only one of uh, many examples of such things in that place. Um, this is to say nothing, of course, of, again, all of the little baubles, all the souvenirs, which uh, were very keen on promoting and making a mockery of those events which took place, such as this t-shirt here, which honestly was one of the more tame from some of the things that I saw during that trip. So what's my point with all of this? Where am I getting? Uh, now, I don't mean to stand up here and say, Oh, you know, how dare you have fun? How dare you enjoy yourselves? Don't you know that people suffered in the past? Don't you know that people died on this ground? You cannot ever have fun because people didn't have fun in the past. Uh, no, no, that, that's not what I'm about. That, that's not the point that I'm trying to make here. Indeed, I have a very dark sense of humor. People who know me more personally, they, they, my, my sense of humor can be quite grim indeed, quite offensive to very many people. Uh, no, I don't mean to imply that dark or edgy humor is in any way some great immorality or something like that. Uh, certainly not to everyone's taste, but certainly not some great injustice to the world. No, I don't mean to imply that that's what I find disturbing about how Salem seems to choose to, to, to commemorate, to remember its history. Indeed, there's a few levels to what I do find disturbing about it. The first being that the nature of the joking itself, the nature of the portrayal, is unforgiving, unconsiderate of what actually took place. It take, for example, jokes about the majority of terrible events, you know, things like Holocaust jokes, things like 9-11 jokes, which again are for the most part, unacceptable in polite society, things which are not exactly touted about and bragged about, things that are told in little dark corners of the internet for, um, for you know, you know uh, scandalous giggles around the corners and whatnot. Um, and, of course, that's where they belong in every way. Well, first off, the town of Salem is very open about it. The, the, uh, the town is a massive celebration of these jokes. It is, it is indeed a walking Holocaust joke, as if Auschwitz d d opened up its doors as a great big festival with jokes and games themed around the ovens and the burial pits and, uh, well, all that sort of thing. It, it is as if, you know, they, um, you know, they accepted the terrible things that took place, but thought, we can make this fun, we can make it family-friendly and entertaining. There is nothing family-friendly, fun, or entertaining about the witchcraft trials, about people being hanged, tortured, and indeed, in one poor gentleman's case, crushed between two stones until dead. But yet, we see here, people walking about the streets wearing the t-shirts, making a joke about it. We see people telling the casual jokes, buying the little baubles and doodads, and wearing uh, mockeries, caricatures, of the things which those individuals were accused to be. Imagine if we had the same standard for Holocaust or 9-11 jokes. Imagine you have people walking around with, you know, uh, with the Anne Frank copy pasta on a t-shirt. Imagine if you have people walking around wearing, you know, um, comically, um, you know, offensively uh, uh, stereotypical uh, Jewish costumes uh, on Halloween, for example, uh, being chased around by SS guards and whatnot in some wacky zany adventure. No, no, people would not 
culturally, popularly find that acceptable. And sure, again, little individual communities online, people would be, oh, you know, that's kind of funny, haha, <laughs> dark humor and whatnot. But society itself would say that's not something that we want to be popularly shown, something that, 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 is, that is common, so to say, something that is so uh, accepted. And yet the town of Salem is so thoroughly accepted. The ideal, the stereotype of the witch is just so synonymous with the town and in not a terrifying, not a terrible way, but in a fun way, like it was some great game. These, you know, dozens of people, even hundreds of people having their lives ruined and indeed a selection of them having their lives ended as a result of these things. No, instead, I think it is a matter of time. And so the question must be asked, of course, my dear viewers, how long, how many years must go by before murder becomes a joke, before it becomes pure comedy rather than dark comedy? Because, of course, Salem, you know, things like, uh, you know, getting stoned or whatnot, uh, Sure, they're dark jokes, but they're commonly accepted dark jokes. They're, they're the dark jokes that, you know, the average everyday person would be like, oh, oh man, look at that, that's, oh, oh, that's, you know, that's pretty edgy, is what that, no, 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 it's certainly not. How long does it take for it to pass into that realm of normalcy? Of course, Salem is not the only example. Piracy, another excellent example. It's very commonly touted. You know, uh, you know. Of course, we we've all seen that one image of you know, uh, um, you know, the children's cartoon saying a pirate or a good pirate never takes someone else's belongings. So incredibly far removed things like this are from the actual nature of what piracy was, which was indeed murderous, rapine, and thieving. Salem is the same way. It is what we see, what we have, so far removed from the actual nature of the event, going from innocent individuals being accused of something terrible completely out of the blue and having their lives taken for it, suddenly now transformed into a celebration of the thing that they were accused of doing. We're really, in that way, stamping on that memory, spitting on the graves of those who passed away. Again, piracy is another great example. The fact that we now celebrate pirates, they're fun, family-friendly figures. There's children's shows about pirates. There's movies and there's games. People dress up for them as a dress, as you know, fancy dress, uh, like a Halloween party, you know, joke type things. It's not even considered an edgy costume in the way that a witch is not considered an edgy costume. So how long is it? How long must we wait until, you know, that SS, until the guy who goes to the Halloween party dressed up as Derlevanger, how long until he isn't actually that edgy? How long until the Osama bin Laden is not really an edgy figure? How long until we can, you know, go to a place like Grenfell with the fires? I remember on BBC, you know, there were a lot of articles about how uh, foreign tourists would go to the Grenfell um, uh, fire site and take photographs as tourists, and people were so offended. People were, were, were enraged by the fact that this was happening, to which I dare say, why? What's the big deal? They're having fun. And you know what? They're probably spending money too. It's probably good for the economy. Lighten up. They're just having fun. What does it really matter? I mean, sure. What? A couple of people died horrible deaths, burning alive and having to jump out of a building. But really, they're having fun now. What's the big deal? How long do we have to wait until that argument goes from being abhorrent and disgusting the way that it really is to becoming natural and accepted and, again, just a part of the family fun? Now, of course, I don't think that something like the Grenfell Fire will ever be uh, um, um, you know, accepted as a, as a funny, common piece of humor. I don't think uh, that something like the Holocaust will ever be accepted as, you know, a common piece of funny humor. I'm sure that things like 9-11 will never be such. But then, you know, odds are the people who stood beneath the gallows staring up at the lifeless corpses of their family members they probably never thought that it would be a funny, comic, common joke either. The people who 
read the newspapers on a bright and uh, early morning in the uh, early 20th century that the Titanic sank, wondering if their own loved one was on that ship and if they had survived the frigid waters or not. Odds are they never dreamed that it would be so common a joke. Odds are the merchant who lost his entire livelihood and who was left abandoned on some desert island to starve to death or otherwise shoot himself with a single shot loaded pistol. He never probably thought to himself, oh, you know, one of these days, this is going to be a real laugh. You know, we never think to ourselves that the terrible things will ever become acceptable, and we always deride those who dare to make those edgy jokes as, how dare you, know, as something unacceptable. It reminds me, honestly, quite, quite, uh, quite so, and uh, uh, of course I won't list any sort of names, but at one point I remember um, mentioning or bringing up to someone uh, the comedy, the producers, and uh, telling them about the, um, the, the little musical that they put on within the musical. It is a musical called Springtime for Hitler, which is a comedic little song about Adolf Hitler. And they looked at me, and they looked, they looked hurt, and I, I was surprised. I thought that they would find the story entertaining. They look at me, they're hurt, and they say, Brandon, that's not funny. The Holocaust is not funny. And they, they made me feel quite bad about myself. It's like, oh, God, I mean, yeah, I, I guess you're right. I kind of kind of misjudged the, um, the social situation there. Sorry about that. But then, you know, a couple of months later, I remember, they mentioned another musical to me, or they mentioned a, a sort of a comedy bit. Mel Brooks, The Spanish Inquisition. And I thought to myself, now hold on. The Spanish Inquisition, if we're going to be giving the same measure, you know, spring, if springtime for Hitler is not funny, the Spanish Inquisition is certainly not very funny either. It was terrible. It was absolutely disgusting. And yet, it is passed off into common humor, common joking. Again, I doubt that the people who were being burned alive at the stake and the individuals who saw their family members being burnt ever thought to themselves, you know, give it 10, 20 years. I'd be okay with joking about this. How long is it? And this is a very interesting question. How long do we wait for something to become acceptable humor? Now, of course, I don't have an answer for that question, and I, I don't think that I ever started this video with an intention of answering it. Uh, it's sort of, uh, as usual, I went off on some sort of a rant, and I have no idea where I've wound up now. But, um, the point, the point again being this, that I don't think that, uh, again, uh, uh, it's bad, or the people who are enjoying themselves in this way at Salem are necessarily doing some great immoral thing. I mean, I think it's an interesting question as when does that sort of thing become acceptable, but uh, I'm not going to deride them for uh, enjoying themselves now that it has become, now that it has passed into that acceptable uh, realm, as it were. I mean, just earlier, you know, I was handing out candy to trick-or-treaters, and there were a few witches among them. I'm not going to spit in the face of a child and say, how dare you insult the memory of the people who are killed so many years ago. Uh, but, uh, but again, it, it is funny, it, it is strange that the humor really does seem to um, embrace the thing which the people were initially killed for. Um, well, in any case. I think one final uh, thing that I'd like to sort of wrap it up with, uh, being that the town of Salem as well seems to really promote this idea. This, 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 this portrayal of the past. It, it really embraces this identity as the Halloween town because, of course, it profits massively from it and its people become wealthier as a result, if also suffering much longer commuting times on their way to work every morning. And yet, I think as well that there is a better way. There's a better, a more honest, a more pure way to remember the past. You see, not all of Salem is this abomination. Not all of Salem is this mockery of murder and torture. There were at least some sites in the town that seemed to remember the past for what it was. There was at least one memorial that I found, which I won't go into too many details about it, but you can see some footage and photographs of it here, 
which was a peaceful place, a, a quiet place when compared to the chaos of the town which surrounded it. A simple, small park, you know, a little um, uh, green way with um, a stone walkway stretching around it, and uh, on or along this walkway, along a, uh, um, you know, a, um, a chest-high stone wall, there were uh, pieces of stone protruding out of the walls, and uh, each one of these stones was not a bench, uh, as it first may have seemed to be, but each one had on it a name. The name of a person who was falsely accused and murdered for that accusal um, as a result of the, of the witch trials. It had their name, it had a date when applicable, and it, it had the, the method of their death. And indeed, there were at least some individuals, some good individuals, who saw fit to lay flowers at these names, perhaps ancestors, perhaps some sort of a town uh, uh, um, community, you know, um, organization of some sort, but, but someone did see fit to lay some form of memorialization, some remembrance, uh, some acceptance that these people suffered an unjust and cruel fate. There were at least some people among that community who were willing to do that. There was another place um, very different in tone, very, very different sort of place, but uh, which I, I think also did a very good job at memorializing and remembering and, and, and indeed making an event out of, making, you know, a, a touristy spectacle type thing out of the witch trials, but in a way that also respected the history. And for that reason, because it respected the history, I enjoyed it so thoroughly, so much. And I think, honestly, that it is such a better way of going about this, a way to make, again, something terrible and tragic in history, not only interesting and entertaining, but also educational, worthwhile, meaningful, and respectful. And that was a, a play, actually, sort of a, an interactive play of sorts, at a historic home called the House of the Seven Gables, where um, it was actually in the uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne home, um, sort of at the same location, um, where we were, you know, a little tour groups. So we were able to go from room to room, and uh, in each one there was a different actor or a series of actors uh, portraying different historic figures from Salem during the witch trials. So there was one, there was uh, one of the judges who was so very keen on purifying the town by any means necessary, and he raved to us about his, his vision, his dream, and how what he was doing was a sacrifice for all of us, and how we must, of course, repent lest our souls be damned to hell, all that sort of thing. There were, you know, the three girls who were, you know, looking out the window, young girls looking out the window and, um, you know, talking about how they're seeing some, something wicked this way comes and whatnot. And they turn around and, you know, then, oh no, you know, all of the, 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 the tourists, the people who were watching the play, were actually the spirits. And they accused all of us of being witches and of corrupting their minds. And, and then they went into hysteric fits, screaming and crying on the ground before choking and... and, and dying and whatnot before us, uh, again, sort of to showcase the, 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 the origin for the hysteria being the, well, well, indeed, the hysterics of young girls, effectively. There were people accused of the witch trials. Uh, um, There's one in particular, an old woman, and, oh, she was, she was an incredible actress, this older woman, and she, uh, she sat, actually, in a chair, old clothing, of course, behind, um, little iron bars, you know, a little jail cell type thing. And she was dejected because she, an honest, good, upstanding pillar of the community for all her life, was accused of witchcraft. And she told us, never or very rarely daring even to meet any of our gazes, she told us the story of how her home was confiscated from her because witches were not allowed to own property, how she was being shipped across to Salem to be tried for spectral evidence, which is to say a complete lack of evidence, and about how the entire community seemed to have turned against her and how her life was indeed ruined. And she spoke about all the others in her jail cells, as it were, and how all of their lives as well had been ruined, and how even if, you know, as, seem, uh, as uh, things seemed to be um, you know, during that time, you know, um, sort of, uh, that was a portraying a little bit of a later period of the witch trials when things were sort of winding down a bit. And how, well, yes, in fairness, uh, you know, uh, they're probably going to survive, but these people being jailed, having their lands taken from them, having, you know, all these different things, even if they aren't going to be killed, their lives are irreparably damaged. Their lives are ruined forever. 
forever, far more than just the, what I think, 16 or the however many it was that were actually killed, many, many others had their lives destroyed by the hysteria of the trials. And the way that she portrayed it was incredibly sorrowful, very meaningful. And she ended actually her little spiel on a note of don't allow it to happen again. You know, hear our story is effectively what she said to us. Hear what happened and keep it in your memory. Do not allow the memory to die. Keep it forward and do not allow such hysteria to take over a community again and have such destruction be wrought as a result of just outright and senseless fear. And there was, there was another, there was um, the very last performance, was uh, a young girl who, um, after the trials, rather, sat in a chair, guilt-ridden, looking at the ground, explaining how she had made accusations about people in the past and how she had been the one to uh, accuse these people of being witches and ruin their lives. And she didn't know why, but of course she was a young girl, senseless, and, and something, you know, but she was describing effectively the hysterics which took over and, and how she regretted what she did so very dearly. Her life as well ruined in the same way, or at least very similar way, as many of the accused were because of the weight of the scarring that such knowledge would impose pose on an individual. And the very last performance was of a priest, of a man after all of the um, insanity, as it were, standing at the pulpit and offering a conclusion, again, uh, uh, the regret and the shame that they, as a community, felt for what they did. The performance was spectacular. It was honest. It was believable. It was educational. And it was entertaining. It was about the witch trials. It was about, you know, the hysteria. It was, as well, respectful. It understood what actually happened. It didn't have to have someone dressed all in, you know, in green face paint with black clothing, cackling and talking about how she's going to get you, your pretties, and all that sort of thing. No, it actually recognized this is what happened. It was terrible. Let's talk about it in an honest fashion. And I think, honestly, that the people who went in there, because a lot of them, as you may imagine, were the people all dressed in black with the funny hair and, the, and all the doodads and the Wiccan symbols and all these silly little things. And I'm sure that a lot of them were there because witches were cool and witchcraft was interesting. Da, 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 da. I do hope that some of those individuals, and, and, of, and of course, I, I'm sorry, that was a little, that was a bit cruel of me, I acknowledge. Um, a lot of them were just regular people, everyday people, who were going to the town of Salem because, again, because witches are fun. Witches are entertaining. It's a joke. It's entertainment. It's fun. I do hope that a lot of the people, as I did, most certainly as I did, I do hope that people left that performance thinking a little bit deeper about what actually happened in the town of Salem. What actually happened to those people who were accused and murdered on a sheer whim? So, by way of conclusion, I, I don't mean to deride people for having fun. I don't deride the average person for looking at the t-shirt and thinking, ha, that's funny. I don't deride the person who, you know, buys carnival food and goes on a ride at a place where people were killed hundreds of years ago because they're enjoying themselves. I don't deride people who, you know, just walk around the town of Salem and, and people watch and look at all the funny things that people are selling in stores, all the witchcraft and whatnot. I was one of those people, you know, I walked around with friends and we enjoyed ourselves very thoroughly in Salem. I really, I really wanted to go just to, to see what it was all about. I don't deride that, but I do think that it is terribly important, just as a, as a society, as a community, as a, as a culture and whatnot, that we have an awareness, an understanding of the true and genuine implications of what all of these things are. A dark sense of humor is fine, but you must remember that, beyond, that above all else, there is still a darkness there that must be honored and remembered and indeed, you know, kept in mind uh, for the value that it would provide, that it provides us uh, as a modern people, you know, the, the lessons that it can impart. The town of Salem, I do not mean to deride its people, but I do deride the town of Salem itself because it on the whole, does not seem to respect 
its history in that way. The fact that, well, yes, it does have a few memorials and monuments to, you know, its, its colonial founders and indeed to the people that were murdered, it also has a memorial to a film, to a movie, Bewitched or something, that made the town popular for witchcraft. Uh, that memorial, that monument, surely should be something that actually matters. I'm sure it was a good movie, I've never seen it, but it doesn't really matter. To give it a memorial, a monument, in the same way that we do our soldiers, our heroes, seems off. That the town of Salem promotes so incredibly this bastardization, this, this, this commodifying, this prostituting of its dark history, that's too much. There's a balance that must be struck, a balance between education and entertainment, between honoring and remembering the past and making light of it. The town of Salem does not do this. Whether there are many places that do, well, I think that's a discussion for another day. And oh my goodness me, there are many discussions to be had about the balance between education and entertainment. But, all the same, I have stood up here for far too long. Far, far too long. Of course, until the next time, my dear viewer, and I promise you the next time shall be much uh, quicker than it has been the past month. I am, and I shall remain, your most humble and obedient of servants. And of course, for everyone, I do hope that you at least had, as the hour is long gone now, a happy Halloween.